Welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys, congratulations. You have made it to the weekend, and this is your Friday Roundup. We're going to be discussing the Monday episode that featured Bryce and Christy from MillennialRevolution.com. And to help me with this, I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How's it going, man? Yeah, so I, I had maybe one of like the top 10 moments of my entire life in this last week, and that's not hyperbole. We actually, Laura and I sat down and explained the concept of compound interest to my nine-year-old daughter, Anna. And to see the light bulb moment for her was, like I said, a, a top 10 moment in my life, like something I will never forget. Wait, are you saying she had a light bulb moment at nine years old? Yeah, I kid you not. It, it was, <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but like she's good at math. She loves saving money. She's predisposed to it. I mean, she, you know, she lives in this household. So, you know, there are certain things that maybe she gets through osmosis, but I don't know why, but we, we just thought, oh, I do know why. So Andrew in our Facebook group made a post about how he was talking to his family. I, I forget the exact specifics, but uh, talking to his kids about choose a FI or FI in general. And it just kind of hit me that like, we haven't done a great job of really talking to our kids, our own kids about choose if I or any of these concepts at all. And many people in the Facebook group talk about, hey, we sit and listen to choose if I with our kids. And I'm like, man, if people are doing it, I, I can start explaining this to my girls as well. So yeah, Laura and I, it was like nine o'clock at night, we sat down, pulled up Excel, and you know she's used to using that at, at school. So she had a, a concept of how it worked. And we basically just said like, all right, you're nine years old, and let's say you have $1,000. She has some money saved up from gifts and, and things like that through her life. And, you know, we just thought that was that was a reasonable way to start. And we just showed her basically saying, all right, if you gave that to a bank and this was very uh, low level, just so she could understand. But if you gave it to a bank and they said, we're going to give you 10 percent each year just to hold your money, we're going to invest it, but we'll pay you 10 percent. Now, of course, 10 percent is unrealistic, but but for this, it, it worked. And, you know, so she got the hundred dollars and she understood that clearly. And every year she's going to get that hundred dollars. But then we explained to her if she took that hundred and added it back in and let it compound. And then they paid 10% of that new $1,100 that she would get a little bit more the next year. And it, it just kept showing her. And then we played it down to, okay, how much do you think you'd have when you were a hundred years old, right? Like 90 years from now. And you know, she took some guess as, as we all do when we're first introduced to compound interest. And it was a couple thousand dollars basically. And then we showed her the number and it was like her eyes bugged out of her <laughs> body. I kid you not. It was crazy, Jonathan. You're teaching this to her at the age of nine. Like if someone told you, Brad, at the age of, you know, 30 something, 36, 38, whatever, they said, Brad, how much do you think you're going to have in 90 years? Your answer would be, well, it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to be here to enjoy it. Right. But just being intellectually honest, you're giving her this information at such a young age that you could talk about 60 years, 70 year timelines. And if they're assuming the robots haven't completely taken over at that point, then this there's a realistic chance that that could, to some varying shape or form, be a reality for her. And that's just incredibly cool. And the fact that you saw her eyes widen at the age of nine years old is just, it's just perfect. I get so excited about following not just your journey, man, but just what it actually looks like for her. What what choices does she make over the next six or seven years directly due to the conversation that you had that night and then the following conversations that surely will follow that? I mean, this can't be the last conversation you have about that. There's no way. No. And, and I'll tell you, she immediately took action, right? Like we always implore the listeners here to take action. And my daughter immediately took action. She had uh, I think it was about $1,100 sitting in a bank account earning 
less than 0.1% interest, which is my own fault, <laughs> admittedly, that it was sitting there. But that was just where we stashed it, right? It was just gifts and some savings she had and, and whatnot. And she's like, I want to invest this. And I want to get this money working. Like I forget the exact term she used, but I mean, she was aghast that she could have it in the market, potentially earning seven or eight percent over decades, as opposed to this piddly little 0.01 percent or whatever it was sitting there. So we actually literally transferred it at that exact moment to Vanguard. We just we took action and she bought. Yeah, I think it was eleven hundred dollars worth of mutual funds that very next day. So, I mean, like. I can tell you for damn sure, like she took action. And now when she gets her little allowance every week, like she's saving towards something and we're going to continue to buy more of the Vanguard total stock market index fund for her. And yeah, it was, it was just a really neat moment. Like she, I forget, I think her exact quote was like, life is awesome. <laughs> that was what she was saying. <laughs> this is a nine year old girl. And like, she was just like, she's looking at this number in the millions of dollars. And she's like, wow, that's all it takes. Like, Life is awesome. And it was just crazy. And it's funny because one of those kind of seminal moments for me was when I was 19 years old. So I was 10 years behind Anna in that case, where I had a like a summer internship at one of these investing companies. And, and someone sat me down and showed me a compound interest calculator for a Roth IRA. And I did the exact same thing that Anna did. I played it out and, you know, I played it with kind of unrealistic numbers, 10% return over 90 years. And if you put in $3,000 a year, I forget what the exact limit was then. But I mean, it was like nine figures. It was like $100 million. It was absurd. And that changed my whole life. I mean, I kid you not, like it actually changed my whole life. That was the moment I found Phi. And that's just the way it is. And I will always look back at that moment as something that completely and radically transformed the entire way I looked at the world. And that happened to Anna this past week. And that was just, it was a really cool thing to be a part of, just to know that we obviously try to raise these girls as best we can. And like, that was just a moment that is going to stick with her forever. You know, I can hear the joy in your voice. That conversation made you so happy. And it, and it, made you so much more engaged in mentoring your daughter through this process. And I'm just thinking it adds another dimension to this game, right? To this path that we're on. And long before you hit financial independence yourself, you're going to find yourself in a similar position where you have a child that you have responsibility for a lot of the choices that they end up making. You, 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 you are their travel guide as they proceed through this first 18, 20 something odd years. And these conversations are priceless, you know, whether or not you choose to have them. And it, and what's really cool about it is it's not all about the kids, right? Anna is obviously benefiting from having this light bulb moment at the age of nine. But guess what? Dad is engaged. I bet you, you got more joy from seeing her make that choice than you would from putting 10 times that amount in your own VTSAX account. For you, that small, watching her make that choice with what to her is 90 something percent of her net worth and making the choice to just take action with it and get off the sidelines, that brought you an incredible amount of joy as opposed to maybe what you've chosen, which is just doing the little things day in and day out. And you know it's a good choice, but it's a predictable path for you. It's just, this is what we do. But for her, you can't take the smile off your face. Yeah, no, you you hit it on the head, man. Yeah, it's all well and good for me to save money. And I've been doing that for a while, but man, this was uh, just a, a life-changing thing for her and, and for me. And uh, yeah, now the the education continues. You know, we've we've lit that spark. And now it's just a matter of like, how do you introduce other things without it being overwhelming? Like she doesn't necessarily need to know about expense ratios. And I think Sunwoo was kind of joking with me of like, did I present the rule of 72 to her about like when, how many years it'll double. And that's all stuff that's coming. I just need to now figure out like what's an appropriate age and like, when does she need to know that? When would it be helpful? Like, I don't want to overwhelm her certainly. So yeah, I mean, if anybody out there has had these talks with their kids, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear how it went. And I think this is really valuable for the community at large. I mean, Jonathan's constantly talking about second generation fire. So if you have tips on like how you talk to your own kids about it, send us a voicemail. Just go to chooseify.com. Right there on the homepage, there's a leave a voicemail button and just just tell us about it and we can play it on the show. Like, I think these are the kind of things that are helpful is like people want these skills. They want to know how to approach their kids. They want to talk to them about it. And it, and it's hard. You know, I had a couple of people ask me for 
the Excel document that I made up. And like, that's something we can put in a future choose if I vault, things like that. Like we can all share these resources because this is difficult stuff. And, and it's, it's helpful to have that community. Certainly another second generation Fi conversation. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, let's go and take a few minutes and talk about this past week's episode with Millennial Revolution. Bryce and Christy, man, they just brought it. What an awesome episode, right? Yeah, this was one of the most fun episodes that that we recorded. It was just great to speak with Christy and Bryce. And I just got such a kick out of meeting them on Skype when we recorded this. We talked for hours. It was just a great conversation. They seemed like just wonderful people. And yeah, we're recording this a little bit early, but we're hopefully going to meet them at FinCon next week, which should be fun to actually get a chance to hang out with them. And and yeah, it's just a, a cool opportunity to meet all these people that we've spoken with on on Skype and all these podcasts. There's two things that come to mind. One is there's what the math says, which I think is where I where I land with this equation. And it's that your home is a horrible investment. The problem is people say, well, I need to purchase a home because it is the way to make it into the middle class. It's the best chance you have to make it into the middle class. And if you don't own a home, then you just don't stand a chance at life. And it is just this great, wonderful, you know, sun is always shining investment. And, and it's just not right, Brad. Yeah, I think what you just described, the fact that it's the biggest investment, quote unquote, like you hear that all the time, like, oh, buying a house, it's it's the biggest investment you'll ever make. It's because most people don't have the wherewithal to save any money. So the biggest component of their net worth is this house. And that doesn't make it a great investment by any means. It doesn't make it anything. It just means that sadly, for most people who are living paycheck to paycheck, the only store of wealth they have is in this house. And for people in the FI community, that simply is not the case, right? We have significant savings rates, upwards of 30, 50, 70% for some people. And we are putting money into true investments, into low cost index funds, into real estate, into businesses, whatever it may be, but things that are actual investments. So I actually, I own a home, but I make the distinction that a home is a bad investment, but it's not necessarily a bad decision. Okay. And that's, that's a separate thing. And we're going to talk about that. Jonathan and I both are homeowners and I don't think it's a bad decision for my life because it provides stability. My kids will go to the same schools potentially for 13 years each. And and there's a lot of value to being in a community, being part of the same swimming team or soccer team or whatever it may be. Like those are the things that I find value in owning a home. But I never, never get confused that this is a great investment. I think it's a terrible investment, frankly, but that doesn't mean it's a terrible decision for my family and my life. Yeah, I love that. You know, Brad, I think it's so important, especially in the heat of the moment when you're going through an episode with some, with a very feisty set of individuals like Bryce and Christie to separate out the soapbox that we were on for that episode, basically trying to unwind all the damage that our social structure puts on you by saying you have to purchase a home. To unwind that, you almost need to go 120% in the other direction. But once we've done that, you can come back to the side of reason and say, all right, is there room here to consider home ownership? And of course there is. Of course there is. But as long as you're not fooling yourself by saying that this is our best chance to succeed at life. And what I love about our community is that we're so aware of the fact that the home is a poor investment that we then start looking to what actually makes a good investment. We know what the math says. We know what's optimal, but we add into that, we add into that equation, all the lifestyle factors that come into play, stability, security, all these other things. And we say, we may still be willing to do it, but we do it in light of the math. And we understand that ultimately you are responsible for your family's financial future. Your family is relying on the decisions that you make. And as long as you're not deceiving yourself into thinking that it's your home that's going to carry you to wealth, then then I don't I don't take issue with it. You know, make sure that you have a plan for your family, and then if you decide that a home fits into that picture, hundred percent, hundred percent, go for it. I, I have no, I have, this is not a show where we tell you you can't own a home. But I think what was so powerful about the episode with Bryce and Christie is they were willing to dig into the math and rip it apart. And and even when you have a situation where you have a home that goes from five hundred thousand to you know, 650,000 and over a period of three years after you dig through the math on that, you realize, wow, I'm, I'm borderline losing money, even in a perfect situation. And it is astounding how people get so caught up in just that number because it seems magical to them, right? Like, oh, my house went from 300,000 in 1989 when I bought it to now it's worth 
550,000. Well, if you actually look at that as an investment on a year over year basis, that is a horrifically bad return. I mean, that's terrible. Uh, but yet, in your mind's eye, you don't think of the arc of your life as a long time. You know, 1989, I'm, I'm kind of picturing this with, with family and friends that, that I know specifically in this kind of, you know, hypothetical here. But like 1989 to 2017 is 29 years. You know, that is an enormous amount of time in an investment lifetime. And we always talk about the rule of 72 and how often you would expect your money to double. So if you are expecting an 8% return annually, your money or your investment would double every nine years. The way the rule of 72 works is you take 72, divide it by your expected annual return and you get the number of years. So 72 divided by eight is nine. So just in that roughly 30 year period, you would expect your money to double three times. So a $300,000 house would be, would go to 600,000 doubling 1.2 million and then 2.4 million. Now, obviously no house that I know went from 300,000 to 2.4 million it from 1989 to 2017. So like that's just expecting a bare bones basic 8% return, which is of course a rough back of the envelope calculation anyway, but that would be a quote unquote good investment. And that's then not including all the things that Bryce and Christie talk about, all the maintenance, all the taxes, the commissions you have to pay, the lawyer's fees, like all these ridiculous ancillary fees that really for most people make this quote biggest investment of their lives a an investment that returns a negative or if not negative, then pretty darn close. So this is a fundamental reframe on how people should think about buying a house. And again, that's not to say don't buy a house because that like Jonathan was kind of alluding to there, like Bryce and Christie are feisty. This is kind of like shock therapy in a sense, right? Like they're trying to make you understand, like get out of that cult that Bryce talked about. Like home ownership is a cult to some degree because everyone is brainwashed. So they tried the shock therapy to get you to wake up and see that. And then now we're trying to, to make you see it's not a terrible decision psychologically for all those reasons that I listed why we've made that decision. But financially, it's very hard to justify as an investment. And Brad, this episode was multidimensional, right? I mean, it really, it started out as a home ownership conversation. And I think we went deep enough into that episode, but you could almost make the case that we should have done, you know, more than one episode because we went so deep into geo arbitrage as well. In fact, I was stunned by the actionable takeaways that they were able to give us about this concept of, you know, traveling the world and doing it at a fraction of the cost of what you might anticipate. Yeah, it was really pretty cool to hear all their hacks and just the fact that they figured out how to do this for such a small amount of money. You kind of set something up in the podcast saying like how someone would incredulously say, oh, you're spending $40,000 traveling. And I suspect people would say that. But like, that's crazy when you think the reframe is your entire lives cost $40,000 a year and you're traveling and having this amazing adventure and you're not living frugally, really. It sounds like they are living the high life in, in many of these places that they're visiting. And now they've taken that 40,000 and brought it down to 30,000 in their second year of full-time travel. So like their entire lives, they are not burdened with the house. They're not burdened with credit card debt or car payments or any of these vestiges of a traditional suburban life. They are just free from all those encumbrances and they're just traveling and just spending on what it takes to live, food and shelter and entertainment. And that is a pretty cool thing. I mean, and honestly, this is one of those episodes that you need to, if you have any plans on doing global travel, you need to download that, save it, and just listen to it as you prepare for those sorts of tips. Because the information that they gave you completely free is worth tens of thousands of dollars annually when you're coming up with these travel plans. I mean, one of the really cool takeaways that I got was this idea of time averaging in different cost of living areas. So spending some time in a higher cost of living area. And then if you're needing to bounce back to a place that's extremely low cost, but it's still this incredibly high quality of life. I mean, they're talking about places in Thailand where they're living in a brand new condo with their own pool and a sauna, and they're doing it for $600 a month. I mean, just something totally ridiculous. I mean, she estimated that you could have an extremely high quality lifestyle for $15 
fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year. And when you view geo arbitrage as a tool that you can use to mitigate your cost of living and average that over the period of a year, it just becomes a very powerful and flexible way at looking at the problem. Yeah. And again, without those fixed costs back home, it's not that expensive to live a life traveling because like you said, Jonathan, they can travel to ultra low cost of living places like Thailand, or they can go to Western Europe for part of the year and kind of almost like average out that cost. And that that's another way of looking at financial independence and retirement planning and even like safe withdrawal rates, right? Like having different plans for different eventualities. The stock market's down this year. Oh, we're going to we're going to live the whole year in Thailand. Oh, poor me, right? Like talking about Christie with these entire tables worth of seafood and $12 massages and things like this. Like that doesn't sound like too bad of a backup plan. So, it's neat to have all these different options and I just love like how they did give us a ton of these little tips like that East Croydon in London. When I go to London now in the future, I'm going to look into East Croydon. It sounds like that is the secret because when you go to London, and I know I speak from experience on this, albeit before I had travel rewards points, like hotels are extraordinarily expensive. And Laura and I stayed in the worst hotel we've ever stayed at in our lives in London. And like, we still joke about it to this day. And it was, it was still like almost $200 a night. It sounds like you can get a, a beautiful Airbnb in East Croydon for a fraction of that and still be on the tube line and be able to get into central London pretty easily. So like just something like that is going to save someone listening to this podcast, potentially a thousand plus dollars on their vacation to London. That, that's just a neat thing. And Brad, I think it's really cool. So Bryce and Christy, we, we had kind of pitched them on the idea of occasionally doing a case study or sharing a case study with their audience. So Christy actually sent us a reader case study that they just did. And we wanted to play that for you now. Give me just a second. I will pull it up. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mash It Up Corner. We take your reader cases, we take your financial numbers, and we use the power of mathing shit up to figure out how to get you to retirement. I am Wanderer, and this is Firecracker from Millennial-Revolution.com. Thank you so much to Brad and John for hosting us on the Choose Defy podcast. What does our reader case look like today? So today we have someone writing in from Nova Scotia, and the reader case is called Underwater. Am I screwed? My mortgage is underwater. So that sounds like what, a great uh, yeah opening. dun 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 ominous already. Um, so she has a rental property that she bought at one hundred thirty five thousand, and because the housing prices in her area is depressed in Nova Scotia, it's actually gone down to ninety thousand dollars. So here we have a situation in which the housing prices are actually not that crazy. In fact, this reader uh, wrote in and said that the rental that income that she's getting on the an equivalent house is about a thousand dollars a month now. Using the Apollo Pants 1% rule of thumb from affordanything.com, that would indicate that for $1,000 a month, if that's 1% of that is your is an acceptable range for a house, that would indicate that an acceptable range for a house price is $100,000. So this was $135,000. So you'd think, all right, well, that doesn't seem so bad. Well, not so good, right? So this person is already um, underwater on their house. Their house is worth how much again? It's net worth $90,000 now. $90,000. And how much is the mortgage still on this? 108000 Okay, so here's the situation that uh, that's called being underwater on your house. It's not pleasant. And the reason for this is because when you are paying a mortgage, Part of that money goes towards interest payments. That goes to the bank that gets set on fire, bye-bye money. But the other part of that mortgage payment is supposed to go towards equity. And equity is supposed to be the part of your house in which you've increased your ownership of that house. But when the house value drops so much, that part of the money that you paid into your mortgage goes bye-bye as well. So now this person has basically taken all their mortgage payments up to now, set them on fire. It's all gone. Bye-bye. And at the same time, the house has dropped so much that they actually owe more on the house than it's worth. So that means if they wanted to sell the house and get out of this bad investment, they'd have to cough up $18,000, which is the difference between the mortgage and how much the house would fetch on the open market, give that to the bank just to obtain permission to sell their house and get their money back to zero. Not fun. So to all the people out there who write into our blog and say, well, housing is a great investment, housing always goes up. Well, here's a textbook example of when that does not happen. But this isn't just a regular house. This is an income property too. So so let's see. How do those numbers look? The investment property is costing them a carrying cost of $934 a month, considering that they're renting out for $1,000. That is a whopping $66 per month. Terrible. $66 a month? That's it? Yep. 
And that's pre-tax, right? Correct. So any taxes come in and you're looking at maybe like 40, 30 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. Oh, jeez. Okay, so, so this person is basically yielding 0% of their investments. And at the time they're writing into us, they're also saying, oh, gee, my tenant is leaving. Am I going to be in trouble? Because I don't know if I can find a tenant that will pay that much anymore going forward. So at the best of times, this house is barely cash flow positive, basically yielding zero. And as soon as the tenants leave, this thing becomes an albatross that weighs around the reader's neck. So not fun. So already just digging into this kind of stuff, we are seeing a lot of problems that we can't easily get out of. Let's hope there's more a silver lining when we look at the rest of their balance sheet. Uh, how much money, do they have any money outside of this uh, outside of this house? Uh, what do those numbers look like? Well, they do have assets of $80,000, but that is mostly in pension and okay, so we can't money touch that, that. They locked, locked away. Okay, so we now, can't touch that. Yes. And they have debt of 152000 108000 of which is the house. And then 44000 remaining, which is consumer debt. Some of that is $5,000 of student loans, 5700 at an LLC interest rate of 12.5%. Ouch. And car loans on top of that. So not good. So to summarize, 150, what was it? 150, 152000 2000 and yes. 108 is the debt. So we're looking at an additional $44,000 of consumer debt. Mm -hmm. um, LLC, student loan, car and loans. car loans. Okay, so not, and, and some assets, but they're all locked away in a pension and we can't touch them until she's 65. So, okay, so we're not seeing a lot of good numbers here either. So to summarize, so far this person is sitting on an underwater house that is very cash flow positive, which will very quickly turn albatrossy cash flow negative. And they also have a whole bunch of debt on top of that that is weighing them down. So, okay, great. Let's hope they make a lot of money on, uh, or we might be in a bit of trouble. What is their income and expenses numbers look like? Okay, so unfortunately, currently her husband has been laid off. So he's just living off EI checks of around $900 a month. And she earns $74,000 a year before taxes and $45,500, around $46,000 after taxes. $46,000 after taxes. Okay. Okay. So how much money are they spending each month? They are spending to the tune of thirty eight twenty eight, the equivalent of 46000 a year Canadian. Now that, that is pretty scary because considering that we spend 40000 Canadian traveling the world and they spent 15% more than that living in a small town in Nova Scotia, that doesn't make any sense since our travels included expensive places like Copenhagen and UK and Switzerland. That is, there needs to be some cutting of the fat in this case. Wow. Okay. So just to summarize there, they are after taxes making $45,000, 45500 I believe, mm -hmm. net a year. And they are spending $46,000 a year. Yeah. So they are not even not saving. They are going slightly cash flow negative every year. Yes. Not a good situation at all. Okay. We're looking at it. So to summarize, once again, an underwater house that is barely cash flow positive in the best of times about to turn really, really cash flow negative in the worst of times. We have a bunch of consumer debt and their cash flow negative spending. Every dollar that they earn is going right back out. Huh. So what do we do? Is it time to panic? Is it time to crack open each other's heads and feast on the goo within, do you think? It's time to mash it up. All right, let's do that first. And then we'll go to my First mash it up, then violence. All right, cool. Okay, so looking <laughs> at their expenses, I am already seeing something jump out at me. They're spending $300 a month just on phone, cable, and internet. $300 that bucks a ridiculous. month? That is ridiculous. Considering how much we spent, which was around $30 for our cell phones and $30 for the internet back when we were working, this just does not compute. I mean, have you ever heard of a, a VoIP? Maybe you can actually look into that. Yeah, I mean, like 300 bucks a month is just ridiculous for telecom. I know Canada has a bit more expensive like, uh, stuff, you, but we're not, like, this is just... Are they oof. dispensing cocaine to you? Because that's the only reason that would explain why that would be so expensive. That would be cheap for cocaine, but that's another yeah. podcast. Um, <laughs> but on top of that, they're also paying $125 a month for two memberships. For and two... Gym memberships. Oh, gym yeah. memberships. Okay. Okay, well, what do you think of that? Yeah, so I think when, in, when you're in an emergency like this, gym is not a necessity. You can cut that right out. So just by reducing their cost of internet and phone down to 100, they could probably do even better. But just, just by doing that, a part of the spending uh, in their expense, monthly expenses is also paying for car insurance for her sister. So if she were to cut the cost of internet and cable, get rid of the gym, get her sister to pay for her own car insurance, she would reduce her monthly spending by $434 a month. 
which gives her an extra fifty two hundred a year to put towards her debt. Huh. Interesting. So, I mean, these cuts don't even aren't even lifestyle stuff. We haven't even asked them to cut. Oh, you're spending too much money eating out or anything like that. We're just switching telecom companies. We are temporarily getting rid of the gym because, again, only one person is working, and we are asking the sister to pay her for her own insurance costs. So that all seems reasonable to me. And now we are able to turn a cash flow negative situation into being able to save five thousand dollars a year um, for their first year. And here's the interesting part: part of those costs, those monthly costs, is the monthly minimums on the LOC on the student debt. And the thing is, the LOC or both the LLC and the student debt are about $5,000 each. So that means in the first year, she can use that money to kill off her student debt. During this entire time, the husband is also earning EI or employment insurance money, uh, which you get from the government when you get laid off. If he just takes that money, kills the other debt, the student loan, both of those loans go away and the monthly minimum payments on the monthly balance sheets disappear, making it even more cash flow positive. So. Is there anything else this person do that jumps out at you that this person should do? Like specifically with what is she supposed to do with that house in which the tenant is now leaving? Yeah, if currently there's nobody renting that house out and she herself is paying eight hundred and fifty dollars a month for rent, she could reduce that from her monthly expenses by moving into the house. Since you don't have a tenant anyway, now you're going to be super cash flow negative. Move into the house, reduce your expenses further by another eight hundred fifty dollars a month without having to pay rent. And all of a sudden, you've dropped your expenses by fifteen thousand dollars a year, right? So then, now instead of spending forty-six thousand dollars a year, you're only spending thirty to thirty-one thousand dollars a year. Oh, so she was paying eight hundred fifty dollars a month in rent outside of her house. Correct. So she was owning a house that was underwater, that was bleeding her dry, as well as paying rent to somebody else. Right, because she had a rental property. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you know what? Move into the house. So by making these pretty, I wouldn't say simple, but they're pretty basic moves here, we're able to turn somebody, these numbers that were basically cash flow negative, digging yourself into a hole every single month, all of a sudden you're saving $15,000 a year. Now, how does this affect her retirement numbers? Okay, so if she were to move into the house and save the rent, cut her cable bill and cut her gym membership and get her sister to pay her own way, all of a sudden she went from retiring never because she was negative cash flow to uh, only spending $30,000 a year, which means after she pays off her debt, she would be able to retire in 20 years instead of infinite. 20 years. Okay, well, that's, you know, that's really still a long time, but that's better than infinity. Her, her numbers before looked just hopeless, but with a couple of changes here, now we can say, now we can think we can retire in 20 years. And this is just with one income, correct? Yeah, and check this out. I, her husband's not going to be unemployed forever. If he finds a job making $30,000 a year, which was how much he originally made, then all of a sudden, their time to retirement goes from 20 years to 12 years, which is not that at all. They would be able to save $42,000 a year because they've cut their expenses and they can, he can put away most of his paycheck towards savings. So all of a sudden, our, their savings rate jumps to 58%. 58%. Wow. So just with a couple changes here, we're able to go from zero to slightly negative to a 58% savings, which is impressive even by our standards. So... Huh. This is actually a really interesting reader case because when we came in here, it was just kind of like, well, bend over and kiss guy because I see no way out. But with a couple of changes here, now we're able to get this person retired to 20 years or maybe even 12. The husband is, manages to start working again. And it just really goes to show you that no matter how bad your situation is, there's always knobs to turn. There's always things you can do. The situation, despite feeling hopeless, is very rarely hopeless. There's actually been almost no situations in which someone has been able to write into our blog and then for us to just kind of give up. There's always a way out. This has been Wanderer and Firecracker from MillennialRevolution.com. If you want to have your numbers analyzed, you can reach us on our blog, MillennialRevolution.com, send an email, go to the contact form, send us your numbers, or send a voicemail to the Choose FI podcast. And if we find a good one, a find that we can uh, a media one that we can really dig into, you we will post it on our blog, and you will hear about it on this podcast. Guys, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I, I love that. I think just to our audience, if this is something that you got value from, if you enjoyed this, if you'd like to see more of these, we actually have had feedback from our audience that says we really want to know what the numbers look like. We want someone to take the time to go into the weeds, and and actually dig through someone's case. Um, we will set up an option for you to actually send your numbers to Bryce and Christy, and, and and they've agreed they'd be happy to take you know a new case study 
periodically. And maybe there's a way that we can turn that into something like a regular feature on the blog. Uh, Brad and I are constantly looking for ways to improve this. You know, this is a crowdsourced show. We love the idea that we can include thought leaders in our community and, and really involve our audience as well. So uh, just give us your feedback on this. Let us know if you found it valuable. And if it is, if you did find it valuable, we would love to continue that conversation. Uh, going back to the case study that Bryce and Christy did this time, if you want to get the full notes to that, we're going to include a link to the full numbers so you can check that out from their reader case. There'll be a link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, this one was called, it was the Friday Reader Case Study and they were underwater on their mortgage, totally screwed. So it was really cool to see how Bryce and Christy were able to pull that together. And, and just to Bryce and Christy, thank you so much for sharing that with us. All right, guys. So I got this really wonderful voicemail from Jack that I want to go ahead and play for you. And I think, it, I mean, honestly, a large part of this journey is just encouragement. And Brad and I, we're just cheerleaders, man. We're on the side. We're rooting for you guys. We're trying to give you the information as we're able to access it and understand it. And this voicemail was encouraging. So it's just perfect to share with you on this awesome Friday. Hey, Brad and Jonathan. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for the good work you're doing to build up this community. Back in July, my good friend and neighbor, Nicholas, sent me a post from Mr. Money Mustache. After a week or so, I finally opened the shockingly simple math post and proceeded down the rabbit hole of Phi. Eventually, I found myself at Choose a Phi and sent my friend Nicholas the link. We're now both avid listeners. It's hard to believe that a simple text from a friend put me on a simple path that would forever change me. For most of my life, money represented an elusive power that was sometimes there and other times not. When I began working, I, like most, lived paycheck to paycheck throughout my 20s, and I made common mistakes, including taking on huge sums of credit card and student loan debt. It felt like I would never break free from the burden of spending beyond my means. The 2008 financial crisis triggered a chain of events that left me exposed and unprotected. Those years of crisis taught me some hard lessons, most importantly, that I was never again going to mortgage my future for short-term material gain. Since then, I've been careful about spending and saving, yet I wasn't able to articulate my goals before discovering the world of FI. It's no surprise that I gravitated to the Choose FI podcast. Your show features thoughtful, intelligent content, but what really makes a difference is the heart you put into it. You care about others and want people to benefit from your knowledge. That's an incredible mission, and I'm happy to see you succeeding. I'm proud to report that in 2017, my savings rate is 44%, and in 2018, I'm projecting to save 58%. Thank you both for putting in the time to encourage me and so many others on this journey. Take care. So Jack, thank you so much, first of all, for reaching out, for sharing your story with us. It's encouraging at every single level to hear that you know this content is having an impact on your life. I think it's amazing to consider the fact that in a not so distant past, you were paycheck to paycheck, just like a lot of us have been at one point or another, and how quickly you can turn it around and get that to 48%, get that to 58%. And the impact that has on the next decade of your life is incalculable. And it's just very exciting that you shared that, not just with you know Brad and Jonathan on Choose F5, but with the tens of thousands of people that are wondering, is it worth it for me to make a similar choice? Yeah, and also just the sheer fact that you in your personal life, that you have your, your friend Nicholas and you two are going through this journey together. Like that was the micro part that I took away from it, which is just really neat that you, you two introduced this to each other and are both going down this path. And now- yeah, you're at a 58% projected savings rate. That is truly remarkable, Jack. So thank you very much for sending the voicemail in. And Nicholas, we actually played a voicemail from Nicholas uh, several weeks ago on episode 40R, and he's crushing this game too. So it's amazing how this concept can spread once you latch onto it. And I know that I've seen in many places before people talking about how it's just accountants and engineers that latch onto this concept. And I reject that because in my mind, they may be the early adopters because they're looking at the numbers first, but Phi can appeal to the emotional component. And while logic can reign for some people of certain inclinations, it's not the full story. And there are others of us that that are motivated by emotion. And if you can tie that to an outcome that we want, if you can tie that to an obvious choice, in many cases, we almost have an advantage because our psychology can get behind this as well. And this game ultimately does come down to psychology, where you're going to put your time, energy, and focus. 
Jonathan, you are spot on there. And I fell prey to this. In this past week with Christy and Bryce from Millennial Revolution, I kind of jokingly said how those couple professions are the ones that have have the mindset that are maybe predisposed to enjoying FI or pursuing FI. But you very rightly said in that episode and here that that certainly is not the limitation. Just because you're not an engineer doesn't mean you can't pursue FI. I mean, that's preposterous. These concepts are for everyone. And that is the important part, that you just have to reframe how you look at life, how you look at your finances, and anyone can pursue FI. It doesn't matter how old or young you are, how much or how little money you make, what profession you're in, what mistakes you've made in the past, all that stuff is irrelevant. It's about starting today and making better decisions going forward for your life. It's not my life. It's not Jonathan's life. It's your life. And your own decisions are going to impact that. And that is just such a cool place to be that you get to decide what your life looks like going forward. All right, guys. Well, that's going to bring this episode to a close. As you know, we finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. We do two books. We do J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth, and Dominic Cortuccio's book, Design Your Future. Uh, if you're interested in that drawing and you want to enter it, all you have to do, just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes, follow the instructions there and leave us a short written review, and then just send us an email to feedback at choosefi.com, just letting us know that you left a review and what name you left it under. We do one book for every five written reviews that we get, and we announce the winners on the Friday roundup. Uh, Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, today we have one winner and the winner is Gavin. And Gavin says, informative and entertaining. I've always been frugal. And after recently graduating college, I started reading some books on financial basics. While those resources were helpful, Choose FI has helped me to improve my financial situation by a power of 10. Choose FI has taught me so much about travel rewards, tax optimization, and countless life hacks. This podcast is the favorite part of my week. Thank you to Brad and Jonathan for hosting this life-changing podcast. In addition to moderating the encouraging Facebook group, I can't thank you both enough. Well, thank you so much for sharing your feedback. Just to our audience, we realize so much that you putting your stamp of approval on this show is a huge deal. You're basically publicly stating, I get value from this show and I want other people to know about it. And, and honestly, you're helping us out more than we're helping you, but this is a virtuous circle that allows us to give back in some small way. And we just appreciate you for joining us as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.